Welcome to this Build It Right presentation, Specification of Ground Improvements in Residential Areas Prone to Liquefaction. This is an introduction to Module 5A of the Earthquake Geotechnical Engineering Education Series, prepared by a partnership between MB and the New Zealand Geotechnical Society. This will give you practical assistance in preparing documentation to make your tendering, consenting and building processes more consistent and smoother. First, a bit of background. While this guidance has been developed specifically for Canterbury, we expect it will be useful for other parts of New Zealand prone to liquefaction. In these other areas, you'll need to take care the guidelines are applied appropriately. The guidelines will be especially useful for geotechnical designers and construction project managers. If you're specifying ground improvement in residential projects, Module 5A provides you with standard clauses. We want to encourage the use of ground improvement in residential sites when it's needed, reduce your contract drafting and construction costs, and support the MB Residential Guidance for Canterbury. It is useful to first understand the sequence of events that lead to the preparation of this guidance. The 2010 and 2011 Canterbury earthquake sequence generated extensive liquefaction damage, which affected some 50,000 properties. A large percentage of this damage was related to the liquefaction of the upper soil layers. Due to the shortage of building resource and the extent of the repair program, MB looked at a number of strategies for the rebuild including repair and rebuild guidance. Guidance was progressively updated as more information became available. MB also undertook field trials at QE2 Park, which included ground improvement measures. The results of these trials were incorporated in an update to the guidance in 2012. EQC, with the support of MB, undertook a science trials project in 2013 and 2014 which tested various foundation and ground improvement systems. They also initiated a pilot project to establish what lessons could be learned from installing selected ground improvement systems and publish the findings on their website. The findings from these trials and the lessons from all these projects helped us develop the content of Module 5A. So, how does this help you with your contract documentation? A contract will typically include five components. Conditions of contract, specifications, schedule of payments, site-specific information and drawings. Module 5A will assist you with the specification component of the contract. The specification included in Module 5A has been structured into several sections. I will introduce these next, then go into more detail later. The first three sections which may be common to all ground improvement projects are a P&G section covering general contract administration, a testing section, this is the quality assurance testing associated with ground improvement works, and an earthwork section covering general earthworks requirements. These are followed by four ground improvement sections covering densified crust, stabilised crust, stone columns and timber driven pile systems. For most single-site residential projects, only one of these improvement methods would normally be used within a set of contract documents. These four were the most commonly used in the Canterbury region, and choosing which one will depend on a number of factors, including the site ground conditions, the depth of the groundwater table, and economic considerations. Module 5A also includes a specific project requirement section. This section will be completed by the specification writer, and should be used to cover things like site location, works area, resource consent conditions, and geotechnical information. If you need to make amendments to the standard specification clauses, this is the place to do it. Guidance notes are also part of Module 5A, and while not being part of your contract, these will help clarify the intent and purpose of the specification clauses and any options that may exist. I'll now go into more detail on these sections. The P&G section covers general contract management issues and is not specific to any ground improvement method. If they are used in conjunction with other specification documents, make sure there's no overlap or conflicting requirements. In addition, some of the other specified contract administration requirements may not be necessary for small projects. Verification testing is important with any form of ground improvement 
to measure whether target ground improvement results have been achieved. Depending on the type of ground improvement used, common testing methods are a nuclear densometer, SPT and CPT, and a dynamic heavy probe. These testing requirements specified aim to provide a balance between cost and quality assurance. The guidance lists mandatory, that is minimum testing requirements, and discretionary testing. The latter depends on the experience of the contractor, ground improvement systems, and familiarity with the materials being used. Its use, therefore, will depend on the project circumstances and should be reviewed on a case-by-case basis. Discretionary testing is usually covered by a specific provisional item in the contract schedule of prices and provided by the person preparing the schedule. Provisional items and sums are implemented by a contract variation. This provisional sum approach enables comparing tenders on a like-for-like basis. Earthworks that may be associated with a ground improvement contract are covered in this section. It covers such matters as ground and surface water control, clearing, excavations, subgrade preparation, fill placement, testing, stockpiling and the use of geotextiles. Larger civil works contract documents will commonly have a generic earthwork specification and this section is more tailored to the ground improvement related works. Leave the section out if it is covered elsewhere or just extract the clauses relevant to your particular contract. If you have two earthwork specifications in your contract documents, then you will need to double check there's no conflicting requirements. Next up are specific ground improvement specification sections. Method G1, densified crust, as identified in the MB guidance chapter 15.3, details a densified block beneath the future building foundation elements. This can be achieved through excavation and recompaction of existing soils, dynamic compaction alone of the soil's in situ, or excavation and replacement with new, higher quality fill with a geogrid reinforcement. Imported material, if strong enough, can reduce the thickness of the ground improved raft. Choosing the particular densified raft system is dependent on the site. Some are better suited to sites with a low water table, or if they can easily be dewatered, and there is also space on the site to stockpile fill material. You also need to be aware of the effects of vibrations and dewatering on adjacent land. MB Guidance Method G2, Stabilised Crust, is achieved by mixing cement with existing soil. There are three methods commonly used, in-situ mixed, ex-situ mixed and rotivated. These methods are described in the MB Guidance. The cement dosage rates required to achieve the specified strengths depend on a number of factors, including the silt clay content, water content, the proposed mixing method, and the degree of compaction. It is considered that specialist contractors are likely to have the best experience in judging the amount of cement to be added, as the construction methodology and particular plant and equipment proposed to be used will have a large influence on the ultimate strength gain achieved. In order for the contractor to be able to control their risk, a certain level of pre-tender soil testing should be undertaken to allow the contractor to make an informed decision on the cement dosage rate. This testing will lower the risk carried by the contractor and is likely to reduce the construction costs. Again, You'll need to be aware of the effects of vibrations and also possible dewatering, depending on the particular method used. And if the soil has a high organic content, you'll need to import new material. MB methods G4 and G5, which are methods involving either stone columns or inclusions, such as rammed aggregate piers or timber piles, are best suited to clean sands as they are easier to densify than silty soils. Densification is commonly verified by CPT and sometimes shear wave testing. Information on both is provided in the MB residential document. It is worth noting that currently there are a limited number of contractors with the appropriate equipment and experience to perform cross-hole shear wave testing, as this methodology for verification testing is quite new in New Zealand. You will need to watch out for vibration effects on adjacent properties, as these can be significant with this method. 
With regard to vibrations, it may mean the works either need to be set back from affected structures or other stabilisation measures used. You will need to discuss this with an experienced geotechnical engineer and the contractor so that the soil conditions and construction method can be assessed in relation to the construction effects. Also, depending on the ground heave and the associated loosening effects on the superficial soils after the ground improvement, you may need to recompact the surface soils. MB method G5B is listed as timber piles, however other materials such as precast driven concrete piles may also be considered. Different specification requirements would apply for concrete piles. This method is often chosen where you have clay or peat materials where other methods such as stone columns wouldn't be suitable. In sandy sites where densification between piles is expected, then this method can be verified with CPT testing before and after ground improvement. Again, vibration effects can be significant and will need to be monitored closely, particularly if there are sensitive structures nearby. Vibration effects can be reduced by setting the pile driving back from the structure. Pre-drilling the upper portion of the pile holes is an option. Or you could use a vibration installation method rather than a drop hammer. You may need to recompact surface soils after ground improvement. Next up is the project specific requirement section to cover items that are not specifically addressed in the template specification. This may include site location and description, consent conditions, variations to the existing standard clauses, new specification clauses, project specific site inspections and recording requirements, background information such as geotechnical data, known site hazards, expected site conditions, ground contamination, archaeological conditions and services. Module 5A also includes guidance notes. It's important to note that these are not part of the contract specification. They are provided to help explain the principles and background to specific clauses and to provide options and levels of detail that may be required. There are some great additional resources available online that I recommend. MB's residential guidance is available at building.gov.nz and in particular Chapter 15.3 and Appendix C4. Module 5A is also available on the NZGS website. The EQC website has videos on ground improvement systems and a report on the ground improvement trials project that they ran. Template documents are available on the MB website, including pricing schedules, basis for payment documents and template drawings. Finally, the earthquakes in Christchurch on the 14th of February 2016 gave us an early indication of how the ground improvement regime performed. The event was almost exactly an SLS event in North New Brighton with ground shaking levels of approximately 0.2 G. Liquefaction was widespread in this area. This earthquake event was important as it provides an opportunity to assess the performance of a ground improvement against a specific load case. Two interesting examples are a stone column site. The ejector was evident immediately adjacent to the ground improved portion of the site but not within the ground improved area. In a gravel raft site, the ejector was also immediately beside the raft. The early indications at both these sites demonstrate that the ground improvement performed well. A study has been commissioned to confirm, or otherwise, these preliminary findings. This concludes our presentation. Feedback on this module can be emailed to modulefeedback at nzgs.org. Thank you.